Exclusively on Secular Media Network, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Welcome to the Atheist Manifesto, your source for news, commentary, discussion, and debate at the intersection of the atheist movement and the LGBT rights movement. The day is May 5th, 2016, and we are live, um, joined as uh, as most times by my co-host Ari Stillman. What's up, Ari? Hey, I have, before we get into the super depressing stuff, I have an adorable story to share. You ready? <laughs> yes, yes, do it. Okay, so everyone knows Jeremiah, right? Of yeah, course, Jeremiah. everyone knows so, Jeremiah. We love Jeremiah. He's been wanting to get a pet hedgehog for a long time, but because he's like a super hippie, he won't go to a pet store. He'll only adopt animals from a shelter, and they finally got a hedgehog in. So he got the hedgehog today, and guess what he named her? This oh, is amazing. What? The Zodiac Quiller. <laughs> oh my god, that's amazing. <laughs> Zoe for short. Uh, well, of course. <laughs> Oh my god, that's fantastic! Well, it's a, and, and it's kind of topical-ish, except for right. bye bye Ted. Cruz. So yeah, sad. That's... so sad you're gone, Ted. <laughs> but but not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, sad sad he was here, and sad about the people that remain. But that's yeah, that's yeah. another story. So. <laughs> This week, um, we're actually, <laughs> despite the the fun opening, we're actually we're gonna have a pretty heavy episode this week. So I want to open the show with just kind of a warning about that. We're gonna be talking about really really tough things like suicide and discrimination, exclusion, uh, and in some of the more harmful effects of anti trans bigotry. With all that's been going on in the country. I think uh, a lot of people get caught up in the political arguments and obviously the political arguments are important because that's, you know, how we get to where we want to be. But I think a lot of times what gets lost are the human stories and the human cost. And one of the the most horrifying things that I have heard in this whole thing is that calls to trans lifeline have doubled since the passing of HB2 in North Carolina. And the fact that Trans Lifeline is a thing that has to exist in the first place is kind of a pretty a pretty salient commentary on where we are as a community. Um, so when I when I when I found that I I, you know, I wanted to do this episode, and, uh, and we actually have uh, Greta, the founder of Trans Lifeline. We have uh, Greta on the show. Greta, welcome. Hi. I was I was doing uh, what you asked me to do and being muted, and then I uh, I fat fingered it. <laughs> Fat finger at the mute button, so sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. So, Greta, why don't we start real quick? You just want to tell me a little bit about your story and how and, and kind of the, the genesis of Trans Lifeline and how that whole thing started? Sure. Um, so, I'm somebody who has a history of suicidality. Um, primarily, like, I haven't actually been suicidal since I transitioned, but all up until, you know, just deciding to transition, I had five hospitalizations I was uh kind of in a bad way and um so one of the things I noticed going to the psychiatric hospital five times is that it's kind of not the best place (laughs) like um it's not particularly therapeutic um it's not particularly uh nurturing it's you're in a hospital and um because you're in a psychiatric hospital, you're on a, on a hold because you've made a suicide attempt or whatever. And um, so they also don't trust you to tell them how you're doing. <laughs> so it's a hospital where no one listens to your opinion about yourself. So it's, it's a terrible place. But um, what I noticed is the last time I was hospitalized, uh, I was not out as trans, but I knew that I was trans and I was talking about being trans, even though I didn't, nobody knew I was trans by looking at me. And the treatment I got was just night and day different once I claimed the label of trans. So, um, and then I had another incident where I called uh, a big national suicide hotline and got somebody on the phone who just 
like didn't even understand that transgender was a word. Like they were grasping for what word is that you, you just used and can you explain it to me? And then they got squicked when I talked about what it meant to be trans. And so I was well aware that there was a need for uh, a suicide hotline for trans folks. Uh, but like most people, I was transitioning. I was worried about finding cute clothes and um, – you know, getting laser hair removal and doing all the stuff that you're doing when you're trying to, you know, do your transition. Um, but what brought me back to the idea was there's a um, trans social group in San Francisco called TGSF. And that uh, group has been there since the 1980s. So it's one of the, the older trans groups in the U.S. And they have an 800 number. And it's just like a like information line or whatever. But it's been out there forever. So the uh, two... Two or three years ago, if you were to do a Google search for a transgender hotline or whatever, you would get TGSF's 800 number. And so I took a volunteer position with TGSF, and my I was made the outreach coordinator. And so they had this voicemail box, and I had to go to the voicemail box and listen to all the messages and return the calls. And it was just full of crisis calls from all over the country. It was people that should be calling a suicide hotline, calling this 1-800 number that they could find. It was the only one that, that was available at the time. And so I started calling people back and trying to help them with their problems. <laughs> and they, they were big problems. You know, it wasn't like, um, where do I get hormones? And, you know, we, to this day, we get calls like that. But these were like big existential problems. And here I am, clueless trans baby, um, trying to solve, you know, pretty much unsolvable problems. So that's where the idea came from, and um, my wife Nina and I, my co-founder Nina, were both software engineers, and so um, we were home one Sunday, and we were talking about this idea of starting a hotline, and, and all we needed was to find some software that would do it, and we found an uh, abandoned open source project um, on the web, and we spun it up, and I raised $200 from friends on Facebook, <laughs> And got the line going, and then wow, two hundred dollars, two hundred dollars to start it. Yeah, well, it it cost a lot more than that over time, but well, sure, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So we got it up and running, and um, I started trying to train operators, and I was trying to get enough people trained before we launched the line, so that we'd have. We didn't really know what the traffic would be like. We had no idea. Uh, there wasn't. There were no statistics on it. There was no way to know. It was just unknowable. It was kind of, kind of. I. I'm still amazed at the you know I kind of went in it kind of into it kind of happy go lucky so it's it's good that it's turned out well <laughs> so uh, we're trying to train operators but they keep wandering off because I won't advertise the number until we have a certain number that I think is going to be enough to answer what I am guessing that the call volume will be so I finally get enough operators and then nobody's calling so I sent an email to Katie Steinmetz at Time Magazine. Um, I had helped her find people to talk to for the transgender tipping point article. And so I had her email address. And so I said, Hey, I'm trying to start this hotline. Maybe you can write about it. And she wrote about it like 20 minutes later on, uh, time.com's website. And we started getting calls like 10 minutes after that. Wow. And, um, and then, it's, it started to accelerate pretty quickly, but then about a month after that happened, that was TDR 2014, about a month after that, Leela Alcorn's suicide note went viral, and our number was reblogged 200,000 times on Tumblr. And so um, from then on, it's just been this, um, for the past 18 months, uh, I'm either trying to raise enough money to keep it going, or... Or trying to find more people to be on the line, and those is like I just go back and forth between those two activities, <laughs> and that's that's what my life's like mostly. <laughs> gotcha. And and so when when you talk about these big you know sort of existential problems, I mean obviously without um, you know without violating anyone's you know personal confidentiality or anything like that, can you kind of speak in in general terms about the kinds of things that you that you get? Yeah, like I had a, one of the first calls I got that was very difficult. It was a. Uh, um, an older trans person that was still closeted who is, I think, in the Deep South somewhere, and she um, was maybe in her 70s and had a couple other significant mental – couple of mental health problems that were pretty significant. And so was – you know, there was this kind of difficulty negotiating like um, 
some of the problems they were telling me they were having and then wanting to transition. And it just, it, I have to say, it really did seem like an impossible situation. And so I understood why this person wasn't feeling, uh, was having a crisis because it's like, wow, that's a really difficult situation. And I honestly don't know how I would uh, deal with it. And this person had been, you know, in the deep South for forever and had just kind of somehow <clears throat> read an article about a transgender person and realized that that was them <laughs> and, and uh, didn't really have the language. It was just like it was somebody who was at square one trying to come out to themselves, and it, it was just overwhelming. And they were asking questions that are like philosophical questions, like, am I too old to transition? Like, I don't, I don't, I still don't know how to answer that question. Like, how do you tell somebody else that? So, right. But, but again, you know, that's a really heavy question for somebody to be asking themselves. So, um, well, and, I mean, is there any formal training? I mean, are you just, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, probably not like, you know, therapists and, and counselors or anything like that, but, you know, is there any formal training that you have in, you know, in, uh, in, in intervention and that kind of thing? So you kind of know the things to do, uh, or like, how, how does that work? Well, I think that, so I don't, I don't have training, but I do have, um, I was a runaway, a teenage runaway and, um, so I've I've been dealing with other people's suicidal thoughts for most of my life. Um, in the circles that I have run in, <laughs> there's been lots of crisis. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we have definitely went, since we start, launched, gone to school on what are the best practices. But what's a really interesting thing is happening right now in suicide prevention where um, – when we first started up, we a lot of people were really challenging us. What makes you think you can do this? Why? And we're just like, well, people are dying and nobody's doing anything. So we think that trumps your concern trolling. Um, but what's interesting is since we've started this in the last 18 months, the you know kind of traditional suicide prevention is moving towards what we're doing, which there's a couple of things that we do different than most – uh, crisis lines, and they were a little bit more controversial a year and a half ago than they are now. One of the big things that just happened is there was a study, and I can't cite it because I just saw it in passing, but I, I was aware of it. Um, and it's actually the there's an article about it from my um, friend Leah Harris about this study. Uh, and I think there's a book about the study too. But anyway, it shows that you know if you if you call a hotline and you say if you call another hotline besides us. And you say that you're going to attempt suicide, they'll send, uh, they'll call 911 and send somebody to come physically intervene and like take you to a psychiatric hospital in what's called a 5150 or it's a 72 hour hold. And you're basically, they say for the next 72 hours, you kind of lose your civil rights. You are deemed to not be fit to make decisions in your own best interest, et cetera, et cetera. And so, anyway, this study, that's been, that's like the law all throughout the United States. But the study showed that people who go to the hospital on a 72 hour hold as a group actually fare worse outcome wise than people who don't. Um, and one of the decisions we made with Trans Lifeline is we don't want to be in the business of taking away people's right to choose what they're going to do next. We don't want to ever be calling 911 and think that the police might show up at somebody's house. So we're anonymous. We we don't have a way to call emergency services on someone who calls us. And even if we did, we wouldn't. <laughs> um, our policy is that um, people can um, – they can opt in. They can ask us to call emergency services for them, and we will do it in that instance. But in uh, – of the uh, – I we've taken in roughly 11,500 calls. That's never happened. So it's not a very popular option. Right. So talk me through like how, how, how does this process work? If someone calls and says that, you know, they're struggling with these thoughts and they're having suicidal ideation and uh, you know, there's, there's a threat that you think that they might actually follow through. Talk me through that process and how you work with that person. Well, so because we don't, call first responders on um, people that call us. We stay on the phone as long as we have to with that person. Um, the thing about somebody who... So suicide is something that happens to people who are isolated. And when somebody has called you and made a connection with you, while you're on the phone, it's pretty rare for someone to actually go ahead and, and complete their suicide while you're on the phone. It does happen, but it's, it's right. not... 
doesn't happen very often. And that's because people generally won't do this. Gen- generally, they're going to do that in isolation. So just keeping them on the phone is, is doing a lot of good. Um, in addition to that, you know, when people are in that place, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling of being stuck in their life, right? And um, not for everyone, but for a lot of people, when they're feeling stuck in their life, it's because they have just decided that some options are off the table. And a lot of times it's just kind of getting them to explain their problems to you and then they start to see them in a different way eventually. You know, the person who calls us is the person that has to do all the work. All we're really doing is hanging in there with them while they explain what's going on to us. Um, You know, uh, I think it's just the act of explaining. And and it's about being – the skill is to be able to listen and to be engaged and to keep the person engaged so that they can keep working through their problem and um, come to – usually they come to another conclusion if you keep working with them. Um, and what the studies show is if you can get people through that moment of crisis, um, it has the protective factor that lasts about two weeks. So basically if somebody calls a hotline and then are helped by it, that lasts for about a minimum of two weeks. If they get no other help, that that's basically, um, kind of enough to keep them going. So we have, you know, I would say that the, the main thing, you know, the, the basis of, of this is super easy. It's just about listening and it's just about getting people to tell their story and tell you what's happening. But then it's, it gets complicated because people are complicated things. And so we have to basically start from square one with people and tell them, you know, kind of all the ways that you might accidentally um, say something very offensive to somebody (laughs) on the phone and tell them not to do that. It's like this exhaustive list of of ways that you might, um, You know, it's about building a bond and you want to avoid doing anything that kind of um, diminishes that bond. And so, like, if you're clumsy with your language about race or gender, that could really uh, damage that person's trust in you. And that could really um, damage the effectiveness of the the call overall. Fair enough. So, I mean, are there there specific don'ts? Um, You know, like, because I've I've done a lot of reading just because I figure, you know, there, you know, there's an audience for the show. I figure at some point there are people who are going to reach out to me and tell me that they're struggling with these things. And that's something I I don't want to mess that conversation up and I don't want to unintentionally say something hurtful. And so like, I, I kind of try to arm myself with, um, you know, just kind of, you know, letting them talk to me as opposed to me talking to them. Um, Mm -hmm. well, for example, one of the things that, that seemed really counterintuitive to me at first, but after reading into it makes sense. You know, if somebody is kind of talking like that and kind of alluding to that, that it's okay to just come right out and say, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Right. Right. And I mean, this is one of those, this is actually one of those cases that we train for kind of specifically because there's a cultural uh, part to this. So um, depending on how much stigma, you know, your particular, culture that you come from has, you might be more or less um, comfortable talking about suicide. And so for that reason, um, the preferred language is to say stuff like, are you considering ending your life? Because there's a large group of people, if you say that to them, they'll say yes. If you say, are you considering suicide? They'll say no. And a lot of that has to do with, it can, it can be about religion. It can be about just social acceptance and what community they're in. And so, um, you know, those aren't things that people think about without being trained, right? So, right, that makes sense. Yeah, so, but there are like, you know, kind of surprisingly few hard and fast rules about what what to do. Um, and those mostly we talk about um, meeting people where they are. One of the hardest things, I think, at first for me was when you have people who've never met another trans person who's just who are just coming out to themselves they might be in a very strange place with their gender. Like they might be saying some very hard to understand things. They might have a com- completely different language for it. They might have only dealt with their gender in a sexualized uh, context. There's all these like difficulties you might have communicating at first on some of these calls. And so it's really about just getting people to meet the caller where they are and to not engage in any kind of politics or, um, policing language or anything and just listening and breathing and trying to get through and find out what this person needs from you. 
Yeah, that sounds a lot like when I, I used to work for a nonprofit that did sexual violence prevention and response. And, you know, I, I asked that same person to a therapist who actually deals with sexual assault survivors. And, and I said that, you know, people are going to come to us and tell us their stories. And it's not a it's not a story that I have. So I want to make sure that I'm speaking competently to these folks. And I mean, she said kind of the same thing. She was like, look, it's, it's really not that complicated. People want to know that you're listening. They want to know that you care, that, that you care. And they want to know that you believe them. And really... Like in in so many cases, that's really all people are looking for because part of the reason they might be in this position in the first place is because they have so little of that in their life to begin with. Right. I mean, I I, I think that's true. I mean, that's something that I definitely emphasize is that this isn't. I think there's been a uh, a tendency um, for this to for suicide to be pathologized, and so it, it's this belief that you need to have some technical knowledge to do it. But when you think about it. You're trying to comfort another human being, and that's something that each of us do in our day-to-day lives all the time. You know, um, we do it with our partners, we do it with our coworkers, we even have ways of defusing things with our bosses. Comforting people is something; it's a it's part of our human, um, you know, uh, dialogue that we have each other is is comforting and and placating people. So, I think that um, this idea that you you know you have to you have to do a study to determine just the right thing to say so to comfort somebody it's like no we know how to do this as as humans it's it's innate to us it's just about not stepping in it while you try to do that <laughs> <laughs> right yeah well that makes a lot of sense i mean you know it's just the idea of making it making the conversation be about the other person instead of taking everything they're saying and making it making it about you i guess right like yeah <laughs> right <laughs> yeah that would definitely be not the way to do like that's a good example of what not to do, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I was going to say, you know, you said there are surprisingly few hard and fast rules. C- can you think of maybe a few hard and fast, like always do this oh, yeah. or don't always do this kind of thing? Well, yeah. Like, I mean, it's never like we would never tolerate anyone violating somebody else's anonymity on the line. So mm-hmm. that's a pretty hard, pretty fast rule. Um, and, you know. Uh, definitely don't argue politics with anyone who's calling in. That's probably another hard, fast rule. And also don't, um, you know, don't bring your religion into the call if, unless, you know, that person clearly wants to have a call about, you know, their faith. So those are, those are some of the hard and fast rules that we have. Um, we've actually been greatly expanding our training this year. So there's probably even more that um, I'm not even, even up to speed with because they just they just started a new training regimen and I haven't taken it yet. So, right, good deal. So, um, and and we're gonna you know we're gonna we're gonna have you stick around for the rest of the show if that's okay. But real quick, sure. can um can you uh, one give us the number and two give us kind of all the requisite places online that we can find out uh, all the information that we need to know. Well, okay, so so one the number in the U.S. is eight seven seven five six five. 8860 and in Canada it's 8773306366. And what was the second thing you wanted me to do? <laughs> uh, just the the different requisite places that we can find things online. Oh, okay, so we're at uh, www.translifeline.org um, and you can find us on Twitter at translifeline and we have a Facebook page as well which is facebook/translifeline. Awesome. Well, I seriously appreciate what you're doing. I think it's I think it's amazing work. Uh, that's uh, it's sad that it's necessary, but it is necessary. So it's something that's super important. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and then we're going to come back, and uh, and we're going to bring a couple other folks on the show, and uh, and we're just going to kind of talk through, uh, you know, our experiences with all the things that have been going on in uh, in the U.S. as of late. More Gatheist Manifesto right after this. <laughs> I've struggled with confidence throughout my life and I've struggled with shame and internalized transphobia and internalized racism and internalized classism. And so I've, I have all that stuff, but there was something, something in me believed I had something special. Telling the truth to myself about myself is awesome because it's just a relief because I don't have to like try to be something I'm not. I can just be. Who you are authentically is all right. The shame is what kills you. Believing that you are unworthy of love and belonging, that who you are authentically is a sin or is wrong, is deadly. 
who you are is beautiful and amazing. It's important with all of the messages that might tell you otherwise that you have that、um, in yourself to say that I am beautiful, I'm smart, and I'm amazing. The staff of Secular Coalition for America. Lobbies U.S. Congress on issues of separation of church and state, and they've become a powerhouse for change in the United States government. You'll definitely want to subscribe to receive their email action alerts. These are updates for important issues and ones that you can get involved with directly. And hopefully, you'll consider making a contribution to the Secular Coalition for America to help them continue fighting for your equality. You can do it all. At secular dot org. Before we jump back into the show, it's time to thank our patrons. Thank you so much for contributing to the show financially and for being a part of this movement. Becoming a patron of the show will get you access to episodes of the show before anyone else. A big shout out on the show, access to an audio journal I've decided to keep detailing the more personal stuff I don't go into on the show, and an exclusive once a month patrons only hangout. To learn more and to become a patron of the show, head over to Patreon.com/slash/TheGatheistManifesto. Thank you. Welcome back to the Gaytheist Manifesto. This week we are talking about、uh, suicide. We're talking about、uh, that, along with some of the just some of the worst consequences of、uh, of basically the situation in the United States right now with the bathroom bills, all the anti-trans rhetoric that's happening,、uh, and and we want to kind of put a human face. We want to put. Uh, maybe, maybe put the, the political arguments aside for a second and just talk about what this means for for everyday trans folks. So、um, we have、uh, Greta, the founder of Trans Lifeline, still on.、Uh, I'm going to bring in two other guests.、Uh, Jen Henderson, welcome to the show. Hi, how are you doing?、Tonight? Good, good. And Jonah Yokoyama, welcome to the show. Thanks very much. All right, so、um, Jen. Uh, if folks will remember Jen from the、uh, from the workplace episode where we talked about you know employment and jobs and that kind of stuff, and she was pretty awesome. And when I、uh, mentioned on Facebook that we were going to do this、uh, this topic for the show,、uh, she reached out to me and said that you know and offered offered to tell her story. So、uh, Jen, do you just want to kind of just just throw it out there? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'll just throw it out there. So、um, I am a suicide、um, survivor myself.、Um, I、uh, attempted suicide、um, at this point、uh, a little over four years ago, and、um, it's obviously something that I never want to experience again. It was a low point in my life that、um, was devastating for both me and my family.、Um, what I'd like to talk about, though, which was interesting at the point, was I was hospitalized for thirty or thirty days or more. Um, at the time, I was obviously in, in quite a state, and、um, I was lucky enough to have access to one of the、um, premier、uh, mental health facilities here in the Midwest,、uh, the Linder Center of Hope, which is an amazing facility. It works with youth. It works with a lot of different people、um, with a lot of different、um, uh, mental issues. And one thing that was really interesting to me about it was while I was in there. Um, not a single physician or nurse、um, had any experience with transgender patients, and,、wow. and for me that was astounding. So luckily they they tried to do their best. They tried to get the information that they could.、Um, I tried to work more on the depression aspects that I was suffering and how to deal with those and、uh, crippling panic attacks that I was. I was suffering at the time due to the depression and, and other aspects in my life, and since then, though, it's I have been able to luckily find a few therapists、um, in the Cincinnati area that、um, will、uh, will will take on transgender patients. But quite frankly, there aren't a lot. So for there to be a resource, what a backstop like the one eight hundred, the trans、uh, suicide line is is extremely important. Um, but at the same time, there is a significant lack of 
of uh, professional help out there for people who are suffering um, from depression that may lead to suicide. Um, now, one of the things that I like to say when I'm talking to people is that, um, you know, being trans is not a, you, you are not mentally ill if you are trans, but being trans or gender, um, uh, gender nonspecific, you, you do go through a lot of stuff every day. And just like we're seeing with soldiers with PTSD, um, it does wear on your psyche. It can cause significant issues, mental issues, um, specifically because you are living uh, a daily basis that uh, for, some, for some people is life or death on a constant basis. And to be under that pressure and to be under all the, um, all the stress that that causes can exacerbate things that are already there or cause things that um, can happen. So that's why I wanted to chat tonight because I am somebody who has uh, unfortunately gone through this. Yeah. And I think what's important to, to talk about here is that so much of the anti-trans rhetoric actually points to the the suicide problem in the trans community as an anti-trans argument, which is, um, right. I mean, it's on the surface, it's just factually incorrect, but it actually compounds the problem because what people miss is that so much of the stress that we go through has nothing to do with being trans. It's the situations we are put in by the society we live in Correct. that cause these I mean, problems. It, absolutely. You know, I'm a person who transitioned later in life. It took me quite a while to figure out exactly who I am, what I am, and what I needed to do in order to leave a, a, le- live a happy and, and, and productive life. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that happened before where you're just trying to figure out why things don't fit and, and things are a struggle. But then afterwards, then there's an, a, a whole nother set of issues <laughs> that you're dealing right. with. Um, I think one of the things that's most telling, and I know that it's one of the, the arguments that is most um, – that doesn't like to be talked about on the side that are against it. But, um, you know, we have one of the premier um, uh, trans youth hospitals here in the United States. Um, uh, here at the Children's Hospital has a um, tremendous um, program. And what's interesting about it is that the statistics are starting to come out because we're starting to deal with trans um, youth younger and younger. And the younger somebody is where they are able to work with a therapist, work with a doctor, hold off um, uh, uh, puberty so that those changes that happen um, don't happen to an individual until they are at a point where they can make a decision their suicide rates, the rates of depression and suicide and all the negative things that can happen are the same as the regular population. Yeah, there so, there have been a few studies that have confirmed that. And it's I mean exactly. it, it's so amazing that it's it's not even just greatly reduced. I mean it brings it in line with the general population. Absolutely, which proves that if someone can transition at a younger age, if it can be identified, they can transition at a younger age, they can become the person that they were at birth, then they don't go through all the additional struggles that might be caused by that. And therefore, you can see then there's the causation with everybody else who wasn't lucky enough to be caught at that young age um, about the additional stresses that are on all of us um, as we transition later in life. Well, yeah, and to put that in context, you know, the the suicide rate for the general population, if memory serves, is roughly 4 to 5%. And the last transgender survey by the Williams Institute had the attempted suicide rate at the trans- of the transgender community at 46%. That's correct. That's correct. And so, that means, <laughs> and, and that's, you know, and remember that's at one time in your life you right. have tried to, so throughout your entire life, so the older you get, the, the more of a chance you have. Um, and luckily those are only attempts. So those are not successful. Um, we don't know how many people were successful um, in, in, in um, lending their own lives um, because of transition, because quite frankly, that's usually not reported. Um, and so we don't actually have really great numbers there, but we do know that there is significant mental stress on the trans community. Um, and it's not caused by being trans. It's caused by living in a society that makes it very difficult to be trans. Absolutely. So, I mean, how, how are you feeling lately? I mean, have you been, have you been feeling, <laughs> have, have you been feeling the weight of, <laughs> yes. Lay, lay down on lay down on my my couch here, and we'll. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 
and I've got to say this, you know, um, uh, two, uh, two or three really big things for me. One, I learned how to meditate. I learned how to be mindful. I'm now, uh, uh, let's put it a semi Buddhist. I don't believe in the, the, uh, mystical portions of that particular religion, but I do, um, practice, um, because it works for me. It allows me to view my emotions. It allows me to view my thoughts in a detached manner, which allow me then to deal with them with the tools that were given to me during that stay at the Linder Institute. Um, So that's one thing. Two, just transitioning has been a lifesaver for me. Um, It's it's allowed me to um, become who I am today. I'm I'm more successful now than I've been before because I'm able to actually concentrate on my job instead of worrying if people might see me out in public away from work. Um, And uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have a very support, um, supportive, um, work environment, um, that they're actually very proud of me, um, which I'm, I'm super happy about. Um, and so honestly, I've never been happier in my life and and knock on wood, I am off of all of my medications and I plan on staying that way. That's awesome. Um, congratulations, because first of all, that's, that's just awesome. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But have you been feeling the weight of, of, you know, recent events with the laws and that kind of stuff? Has, has that stuff been weighing on you like it has on a lot of folks? Yes, or? but i got to tell you, um, I'm, a stronger, I'm a much stronger person now than I was. Yeah. And I think the people around this, you know, around this quote-unquote virtual table are. And so for me, the, the, the stress that I'm feeling from the politics that are going on have more to do with worry about um, my family and the way that they're perceived. Right. And kids that are out there that I know that don't have the advantages that I, I kind of milked 40 plus years of white male privilege. So I'm in a pretty good spot. And I know that there are a lot of people out there that are not in that same spot. Um, and I learned that a long time ago. And that was actually part of my de- depression because I learned that, um, and I know it's a little, uh, a little bit of a, um, um, trigger subject with some people, but um, I started a lot of my gender exploration by doing drag. And mm-hmm. it was really important to me, and I really liked it, and, and it was an outlet for me. Um, but one of the things that really scared me was when I was performing, and this was um, you know, when I first started 15 years ago, um, they showed me back into the dressing room, and they said, um, you know, and here's the, uh, here's the uh, first aid cabinet in case anything happens. And they opened it up, and there was nothing in there but a bottle of baby oil. And I was like, okay, that, that's really super strange. And what they told me was, so here's the deal. If anybody gets hurt and they apparently had, had somebody where this happened and they fall down and they need an ambulance or whatever, you're to take the baby oil and you're to dump that all over their face to melt off the makeup so that they can get cleaned up and look like their birth gender because – We've had drag queens that have been injured and they've gone to the hospital in drag and they have had terrible times where like literally somebody lost their life. God. So I'm sorry when the emergency procedure here is not medicine, it's let's make sure that you don't get hurt, harassed or killed on the way to the hospital. I knew how dangerous it was to be doing this just on a Saturday night, let alone living that as your entire life. Right. Uh, so at this point, I want to bring Jonah into the conversation. Jonah, um, anybody who's followed me on Facebook knows that uh, Jonah and I had a meeting with an Ohio state legislator named John Becker, who is um, kind of the arch conservative of the Ohio state legislature. Uh, the guy bills himself as the most conservative politician in Ohio. And, you know, his email signature line has all of these quotes from newspapers about how he's like the arch conservative and, um, just, I mean, just beating the hell out of his credentials as a conservative. And he had, let the media know, I guess that he was looking into writing a bathroom bill for Ohio. And I found this out. Someone sent me an email and said that, you know, a news station was looking for comment. So, you know, they came over and, you know, we did the thing and, and as part of the news story, I heard that he was looking for comment from the trans community and that he was willing to meet with folks to talk about it. 
And so I sent him an email and I did not expect a response. Um, I, I, I was ready to be like two or three days later. Ha ha ha. This guy's, you know, this guy said he wants to meet with the trans community. And then I sent him an email and he didn't respond. What a dick. But, uh, you know, sure enough, a couple hours later, I, I got an email back saying, Hey, sure. Let's go get coffee. I'll buy. And so I was really surprised by that. And then I, and I was actually a little hopeful to be honest with you, um, because I thought like, wow, he at least wants to meet face to face. And maybe if we can put a human face on this, on this whole thing, you know, maybe, maybe we can put it to bed before it starts, you know, um, in retrospect, that might've been a little overly optimistic of me, but, um, when uh, when I posted on Facebook that I was going to be meeting with this guy, Jonah sent me a message and said, hey, I'd love to come too. And I said, yes, absolutely. You need to be there. And the reason is, is that Jonah is a person who has experienced assault for being in the quote unquote wrong bathroom, which is exactly the kind of thing that's going to happen more and more. And more. Already happens a lot and it's going to happen more and more as these conversations get super heated and as these bills pass and as these debates grow. So, um, Jonah, do you just want to kind of take me through that experience? Sure. So first of all, I've experienced assault on both sides of transition, medical transition. Um, when I was 18, I was using a men's room. I had not begun my medical transition and three guys came in and they had a problem with me being there. They started questioning me about my gender, about what I was doing there, that sort of thing. And it was pretty nasty. They began hitting and kicking me, um, they broke ribs and eventually they urinated on me. <sighs> um, the other experience I had was actually just a few years ago. And this was after I had, um, started my medical transition after I had my gender marker changed on my ID and all of that. And it was at a local college. Um, I was taking a night class. It was one of the last ones to leave the building. And I started tutoring one of the guys in my class. Uh, we got kind of friendly too, but then he started showing some bigoted ideas and I decided to come out to him. He called me names and like he, she and it, things like that. He laughed about it. And he began to do these like really shitty things in front of other people. Like uh, he'd hit me with his backpack while he was walking down the road, but he'd make it look like an accident. Then he'd grab my shoulder really hard and apologize. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. And it sounded sincere. It sounded okay. It looked okay to other people, but it really wasn't. Um, and I, I went to the campus police who said that they couldn't do anything about it. And they suggested I start using the staff bathroom, which was one floor up. And I'd have to find someone when most of the people in the building had already left uh, to get a key to open it. <clears throat> um, so I tried to be careful when I needed to use the restroom. I tried to time when I was going to go so that I wouldn't run into him or I'd be less likely to run into him. But one day uh, I was in the men's room and there was one other guy who had just come in. As I was heading for the exit, the guy who had been harassing me came in. He did not say anything. He simply stood in the doorway, blocked the door and grinned at me. He would not move. I was really afraid. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm really ill right oh, now. Oh, you're okay. <laughs> you're okay. <laughs> I was afraid of ending up alone in the bathroom with him. So <clears throat> I told him to move. He wouldn't move. I eventually tried to push past him and he sort of shoulder checked me into the wall. There was this shoving match. I eventually got past him. I was bruised and bleeding a little bit and I went for campus security mm -hmm. and campus security said, wait, you, you're what you were where you'd better drop this before he presses charges against you. And I'm guessing that's where it ended. Yeah, I felt fairly powerless and was really just trying to make it through school on my own. I didn't have bandwidth to fight this. <sighs> yeah. Um, and, and what I think, I mean, we, we, you know, we talked about some of these numbers in the last episode because uh, we apparently just have to keep talking about bathrooms because – um, the debate, you know, just won't go away. Um, you know, in Washington, D.C., a state that has one of the most inclusive laws surrounding public accommodations, there was a study that said 70 percent of uh, transgender, gender nonconforming folks reported some kind of harassment when trying to use the bathroom. 
70%. That's, that's not just a significant number. That's a, I mean, that's an overwhelming majority. And people think that we're the problem. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. Um, I mean, besides the two instances I just told you about, I've, I've had mice pulled on me, I've been yelled at, I've been threatened, I've been told to leave in women's rooms and men's rooms. So, you know, it's a very common experience. People go through this all the time. People who aren't even trans identified. And so, and uh, for the, for those who don't know, Jonah's been on the show before as well, but Jonah's the director of Heartland Trans Wellness Group. And um, I, I'm on the board of, of Heartland with him. And, and we're basically, we're a Midwestern support organization for trans folks. And we provide, you know, various kinds of services and community organizing and things like that. So um, Jonah, you want to talk for just a second? You'd mentioned something to me about how, cause I, I talked at the top of the show is talking about how the call volume to trans lifeline has doubled. And you had mentioned that, you know, uh, we at Heartland were getting so much more contact as well because of all of this stuff. Can you kind of talk about that for a second? Yeah. So we have a website, transwellness.org. We have a Facebook <clears throat> page, Heartland Trans Wellness. Um, we have private Facebook groups as well, things like that. We have an email service and a phone line. Um, with all of these put together, we have experienced something around a 40% increase in volume in a, the last two weeks. Um, I've seen an uptick uh, in people who are really frightened, who are having a lot of anxiety, panic attacks, who are increasingly suicidal because of things, uh, things like the House Bill 2 in North Carolina and uh, Representative Becker's um, proposal of a bathroom bill here. These are having real effects on local people, on people throughout the state, throughout the U.S. There's, there's a real cost to this. And I imagine a lot of that isn't because of necessarily, in, although it could be part of it, necessarily increased you know, harassment in public. I think maybe for most people, a lot of it is just that these topics are being brought up more and they're seeing that the people around them are not quite as supportive as they thought they were at least that's been that's been the case for me i haven't had any kind of issues with you know harassment in bathrooms but you know this being such a hot topic it's just like wow people are way more transphobic than i thought they were and i already thought they were pretty transphobic so like how am i supposed to feel valued and feel like you know me and and my community matter in this kind of an environment when people are you know hurling slurs and talking about terrible things, you know, online and at work and in school and everywhere. Well, yeah. And, think... and that's the rub, right? Because, because visibility is like, I mean, we need visibility, but visibility also brings that inevitable backlash. And that backlash is, is, al is almost entirely felt by the more vulnerable folks in the community. Right. Jen, you're about to, we... or Greta. Yeah. 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 I think we need to acknowledge, like, I don't think I had, I think it had been not very many times on my Facebook feed where I would see somebody reporting that they had been attacked, but it's happened three or four times in the last month where I've seen somebody that I know has been attacked in some way, and that, right. that was not the norm. So I do think violence is way up against trans people. I think harassment is way up against trans people. I think that basically everything that is normally done to us is being done at a higher rate right now. So it's not just that people are feeling bad. It's that people are, are under siege a little bit mm. because of the you know transness being used as a political football and I, I think it really is important that you know between now and November even though even though we lost Ted Cruz in this election so yay we the super transphobic one's gone but I, I still think that the um, the rhetoric has it has made it so that it's probably going to be a rough time between now and the end of the year and no, so I, I think we need to do we, everything we, we can yeah, and we saw this. I mean, we saw this coming as soon as the um, uh, gay marriage decision was made. Um, right. There was a lot of fear that, like HRC and other groups, would sort of like fade away. And luckily, they have not. They're still very supportive. Um, but we knew that the right was going to very much have to find yet another target, and we knew we were on the list. Um, so it, it's not a surprise that these bathrooms bills are coming because if you can scare somebody that their child is in danger that gets them to the voting booth and while they're there they might as well vote republican but they're really there because they're scared about the the rhetoric 
And and the issue is that that scare, that being scared, not knowing a person who's trans, not having a relationship with somebody who's trans, but only knowing that they are now causing some sort of danger to my family, mm-hmm. um, makes us a target for those attacks. And it's a very, very emotional target. And oh, yeah. so it's not, it's not a thought. It's not logical. It simply is. And especially, you know, and I've, I've made this observation before. If you look at it, you know, trans women are afraid of being in men's bathrooms. Yeah. Women are afraid of men being in their bathrooms. What are, what's, what's the common thread here? It's men. <laughs> Men are the issue. <laughs> Sorry, Jonas, right. but men, men are the issue. They are afraid of them in situations where, we're, where we are compromised. And now we've got a lot of angry men who are very much ready to defend their family because of this fake narrative of predators being in the bathroom. And here is somebody that I think I really should um, teach a lesson to. Yeah, well, and, 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 and this kind of comes down to a lot of rape culture, right? So we're trying to put laws on victims and potential victims rather than trying to teach people not to rape. Yep, absolutely. I had a, a really great conversation. I gave a talk to a local atheist group here um, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, and one of the questions that came up was why you know why trans people now? And I think the answer is that obviously with Obergefell, the political you know, the, the political fight is kind of lost there. I mean, there's, there's lots more space to go with, with non-discrimination laws and that kind of thing. But the big like emotional debate surrounding marriage, this years long thing, like that's over with and they lost and they just kind of, you know, they're, they're doing their best to kind of chip away at it. Like they are Roe v. Wade. And, um, and, and apparently there was actually a meeting of conservatives where they actually said, like, that's our strategy with the marriage decision. You know, since Roe v. Wade, we've done everything that we can to kind of chip away at it. And that's what we need to do with Obergefell uh, v. Hodges and just kind of chip away at it. And that's why you see the, things like these, you know, Religious Freedom Restoration Act laws and pastor protection laws and that kind of thing. But I think what it also is, is that I think gay people have achieved a certain level of visibility in society to where it's not so easy to demonize them, right? We have really famous gay people. We have gay people on TV. We have openly gay and queer musicians and movie stars and TV stars. So it's really tough for a conservative lawmaker to say, oh, these gay people are are all this. And everyone in our head knows like, yeah, but that's not really the case. So trans people don't have that level of vi- visibility. So in a lot of people's minds, trans people are, are the question mark. Right. And right. so what happens is, you know, you get together at these meetings of, uh, you know, these town hall meetings at, you know, where they're talking about these city ordinances and this kind of stuff. And the first time anyone is hearing about trans people is when their children's safety is being supposedly threatened by trans people. And it doesn't even well, matter if it's true. That's just the first thing that they hear. Well, and, and that's the thing that's so insidious about this particular argument is actually they're not saying that trans people are dangerous. What they're saying is that there are these perverted people who will, who will pretend to be trans in order to take advantage of this new privilege of actually being able to pee. You know, so, I've, I've heard more of that. But I have heard plenty of trans people are potential sexual predators, too. Well, and and, and let me put it this way. So you hear that in the chat underneath the the big stories. You hear that um, in people talking to each other, at least in the legal things that they are doing when they're making the arguments in front of large groups of people. They're simply saying, well, just any guy can say that I'm trans today and I want to use that bathroom and I'm going to use that to have access now to these women. So what one thing that I have said, and I put this on my Facebook, is I am actually all for bathroom laws. I am for bathroom laws that double, triple, quadruple the jail time and the sentencing for anyone who, ra- who harasses somebody, rapes somebody, in any way harms somebody in a restroom. But that has to go both ways. That's me using that restroom, and that's anybody else using that restroom. Yeah, All I right. agree completely. I mean, well, and it's that's one of the main arguments, right? This stuff is already illegal. <laughs> it is already illegal, and if you're so scared no, no, about no, it, you it don't it understand. It makes it so illegal. that it's it's legal for trans 
people to rape people in bathrooms now. Duh. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, that's the that's the, exactly the rules we want passed. I would like my free rape card, please. Oh, exactly. <laughs> oh. I mean, it's, and it's absolutely ridiculous. I mean, yeah. and and the other thing, by the way, and just to be like fully transparent here, um, it I have never had a problem in a restroom, not once. Okay, but I also have to tell you, I'm also six foot five and over two fifty. Okay, and I've been told I look like I can take a punch. So. <laughs> You know, I'm just telling you that I think that, one, I go in there, I use the restroom, I wash my hands, I walk out, I, I don't do anything but that. And two, I don't think that people really want to pick a fight with somebody who actually might push them back. Yeah, that's true. Jonah, were you about to say something earlier? Yeah, I think that really, no matter how it's dressed up currently, this really comes down to fear and the perception that people are other. And I'd like to tell you a little story, a formative story for me. Back in fifth grade, I was on the playground. We still had playgrounds with playground equipment and really tall slides and everything and even trees. And I realized that the playground got really quiet and that's just not normal. And then I noticed that the kids were kind of um, congregating in a ring in the ring of trees um, around some of the playground equipment and just standing there. Everything's, you know, raising up the hairs in the back of my neck. Everything is strange. So I walk over there and I start to hear a girl yelling, help, help her, please. Um, I get closer and I peek in and I see one of those really tall slides, uh, you know, one of those like 10 foot tall ones that was metal. And one girl is on top of the slide and another girl has fallen off of the side of the slide. Um, These two girls were in special ed classes. And so they were some of what uh, people would have considered the most other at our school. Right. And her dress had gotten caught on one of the bolts on the side of the slide. She was several feet off the ground. It had pulled up around her neck and she was turning purple. She couldn't breathe. And everyone was standing there staring. I looked around and at the time I was one of those super shy kids. Like I couldn't even go order a drink. And I was like heart pounding, waiting for the leaders of our class to do something like looking at them and just watching them stand there. And eventually I was able to suck it up and I went forward and I started screaming my full head off, you know, go get the coach. And I wrapped my arms around her legs and tried to lift her up. And I was able to lift her up enough that she got a breath and she started yelling and kicking and everything. And I just kept screaming and eventually I'm flying through the air. Turns out the coach had come, shoved me out of the way. I got her down. She ended up being okay. And that taught me a lot. That taught me about her herd mentality. That taught me about fear. That taught me about people not wanting to stand out. And that taught me that one person can make a real difference. Wow. And stories, I I think stories like that are probably far more common than, than we might think. Yes. Well, um, we're going to take another quick break here. I want to invite folks to call in. Uh, we have, we have a phone number here. It's the greatest phone number ever. 513-878-0GAY. If uh, folks want to have uh, questions, comments, they want to they want to ask the guests uh, stuff that they want to talk about, I would definitely want to invite folks to call in. Uh, so we're going to take a uh, a quick break here, and we will be right back with more Atheist Manifesto. What's up, everyone? My name is Jamie, and I'm with an organization called A Voice for the Innocent. We are a community of support for people who are affected by sexual violence. We are super excited to announce that we have partnered with the Vans Warped Tour to launch the Save Our Scene campaign. It's an initiative to reduce sex crimes in the music industry, and we've been working tirelessly to make sure it's as powerful as it can be. We've written an in-depth training for the bands on the tour to help them better understand the scope of the problem and learn how they can be part of the solution. We've done hours upon hours of research to compile every last resource we can find for people who have experienced sexual violence. We then took these resources, sorted them by location, and created state-specific free literature to hand out to music fans at every date of Warped. On top of that, we will be reaching out to people at every stop to let them know that we are another resource for them, and if they have a story to tell, we have a place where people will listen. This is, quite frankly, the largest project we have ever taken on, and we are extremely excited to have this opportunity, but we need your help. Sending two people on tour costs money, not to mention the cost of printing literature for every date 
on top of all the materials we will need to make our campaign have the largest impact possible. This includes a tent, merchandise bins, dollies, and all the other odds and ends that come with touring and implementing this campaign. We are asking for your donations. Anything you can give will get us closer to our goal of reaching as many people on the tour as possible. To donate or to learn more, visit SaveOurScene.org. Thank you to everyone who is able to help us in this endeavor. And as always, thank you so much to those of you who have already helped us along the way. Hopefully we will see you out at Warp Tour. Hi, this is Trav Mamone of the By Any Means Podcast. The By Any Means Podcast is a weekly show where I interview guests about the intersections of social justice and humanism. Just go to www.byanymeans.com, that's by spelled B-I, to hear the podcast and read the blog. Because, hey, aren't we all a little bi curious? Here's an excerpt from Nailed by David Fitzgerald. Didn't there have to have been a Jesus? Perhaps he was just a wandering teacher or an exorcist, an apocalyptic prophet or a zealot who opposed the Romans. Perhaps he was all these things, or even a composite of several such early first century figures. But at any rate, surely there had to be somebody at the original core of Christianity, arguably the most famous individual in human history. All this seems to be a perfectly reasonable, completely natural assumption to make, so why would anyone be so foolish as to propose that Jesus never existed? Doesn't it just make more sense to assume that there was a historical Jesus, even if we're unable to recover the real facts about his life and death? As it turns out, no. The opposite is true. The closer we look at the evidence for Jesus, the less solid evidence we find, and the more we find suspicious silences and curious resemblances to the pagan and Jewish religious ideas and philosophies that preceded Christianity. And once you begin to parse out the origins of this tradition or that teaching from their various sources, the sweater begins unraveling quickly until it becomes very difficult to buy that there ever was, or even could have been, any historical figure at the center. Nailed by David Fitzgerald is now available at atheistaudiobooks.com. Welcome back to the show. So I mentioned a little earlier that uh, Jonah and I had kind of had our own little adventure with our conservative lawmaker friend from the state house in Ohio. And uh, Jonah, if it's cool with you, you had an adventure with him, huh? (laughs) Yeah, it was Callie and Jonah. It was it was precious. (laughs) So, um, (laughs) you know, initially after the meeting, because I'll be honest, I left the meeting feeling a little bit better than I expected to. Um, there were definitely some frustrating things and some points of contention and stuff like that, but I actually left the meeting feeling pretty okay about it, given that you know we were talking to the supposedly most conservative guy in the in the Ohio State House. Um, but since then, I've gotten far far less uh, <laughs> hopeful about these interactions, and I think Jonah, you're probably even a little further along on that on that journey than I am. <laughs> so, Just a little. <laughs> so, I mean, initially. I had said, like, you know, I'm not going to dish on, like, every detail of the conversation because I feel like, like, I want him to feel like that he can come to me and, you know, other members of our community without, you know, everything that he says ending up on a podcast or something like that. But after spending more time in conversation with the guy, I'm just going to kind of I don't give a shit anymore, really. Yeah, Callie <laughs> flipping tables up in this bitch. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's what's happening. So, um... So, so, Jonah, do you want to do you want to lay it down, <laughs> like how that whole thing went? Well, you know, we educated him on so many different things. We talked about um, trans 
trans identity, non-binary identity, gender non-conforming people, people who don't have trans identities but would be affected by this law, uh, disorders of sexual differentiation, on and on and on. And he pretty much, his response was always, wow, I had no idea. That's so complex. That, that's so interesting. Thank you for telling me this. And it went in one ear and out the other as far as we we can tell, and other people have had these conversations with him as well. And what I keep hearing is that he's acting like it's news to him every time. It's oh. bizarre. I, I don't understand why he's <laughs> responding like that. Um, I even heard snippets. I didn't hear the whole interview, but I heard snippets of him on 700 WLW, which is a conservative um, radio station around here. And, and even they were kind of mocking him and, and saying some of the same points that we'd said and other people have said since. Yeah, um, I was I was actually on uh, Scott Sloan, the the guy who he was on with. I was on Scott Sloan's show uh, talking with him, and I was I was shocked at how like in line he was. I mean, he had some pretty funny ideas about like like he kept pressing home the like, well, isn't it like natural to be curious about somebody's genitals in a situation like this? And I'm like, dude, come on, <laughs> like can we not make everything about our genitals, please? Well, yeah, but, I mean, like, <laughs> so yeah, I was on yeah, I was on two days later on WLW. They're great. They let us on a bunch now. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, the biggest thing there is I think what ha- what's happening is you've got a person who is doing this not for the right reasons, even in their own head. They're doing it because the talking points are winning them political points with some twisted little group that is sending him money or whatever. Um, you know, and the other part of this really is so I, I you know, I run a, a, a I run the technical division of a pretty large company here in the Cincinnati area. Um, we're constantly trying to bring in people from all over the United States to work for our company and we have to sell Cincinnati. We really do. Um, people are like, well, I'm in New York, I'm in LA, I'm in Chicago. These are really cool towns. Why would I want to come to the Cincinnati place? And I mean, we're still literally fighting over, you know, the, the concept of the, of the, the Maplethorpe obscenity trials from 25 years ago with, with Charles Keating. And now they want to do this kind of shit. I won't be able to hire anybody, anybody, out from out of state if they decide to do a bathroom law in Ohio. Period. Yeah, it was it was yeah. so interesting. One of my favorite things was watching the look on this guy's face while Jonah is explaining non-binary identity. Oh man, and I would pay so much money to see. Why that. did you do trans like, two hundred four when he needed one hundred one? Come on. No, well, <laughs> well, hang on. Well, I feel like the the fact that non-binary people exist is I, I feel like that's one hundred one. But I mean, it was even like it wasn't even the focal point of the conversation. Like the entire overarching point was that like trans doesn't just mean this one thing, and he was listing off like you know it's like you know not all trans people get surgery, not all trans people have ho- get hormones, not all trans not all people trans are people obviously are trans. Like yeah, and then he was like, and not all trans people are binary or or you know identify as male or female, and he was like, what? <laughs> and really? it was. <laughs> yeah, it was it was the funniest thing to see the look on his face. And my my favorite favorite thing that happened. And um this this may <laughs> the, the way that I've exp- seriously I like I, f- I felt like I was almost about to have an orgasm when this happened because it was one of the most fantastic things that's ever happened in my life. He pulls I thought out you were going to fall off of your chair. <laughs> he had he had this folder, right, that had notes in it. And I thought it was just like a notebook for taking notes or whatever. And Jonah and I were talking to him about how, like, the the whole tr- – someone dressing up as a trans person to assault someone in the bathroom is, is just not a thing that happens. So he pulls these printed out articles out of this folder from LifeSite News, which, if, if anyone doesn't know, is, like, a super hardcore right-wing extremist site. Like – Basically, all they do is gay bash, trans bash, and uh, and talk about uh, how much they hate abortion. Like, that's basically all this site exists for. And there were two stories that he had pulled out. One of the stories I actually knew was uh, had been pretty thoroughly debunked, and the other one was the one that I hadn't heard of. So we're talking... And he says very much in passing, we well, know I haven't really fact checked these. And I was like, whoa, hang on a second. <laughs> hang on a second. And I looked him dead in the eye and I, I even gave him like the, you know, like when, when a dog, when a dog does something that you don't understand, they kind of cock their head to the side a little bit. Like I did that. <laughs> and I looked at him in the eye and I was like, you're trying to limit my access to society based on these stories. And you're telling me you didn't fact check. Are you serious right now? 
and he just kind of looked at me for a second. He like sat back in his chair and he was like, yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> and it's you like, uh, 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 uh. And, and it's, I mean, it, it's, that's where we are, you know, he's, and yeah, he sent but me you a, people are icky and make me feel weird. So it's well, okay. And that's what it comes down to. Right. <laughs> I mean, so he sent me a PDF of like, you know, the kind of the outline of whatever that he's trying to do. And one of the first things was targets policy has created this problem. And I was like, dude, do you understand that this has been targets policy for years All Target did a couple of months ago was say, hey, you know what? There's been a lot of debate about this. We just want to remind folks that we're inclusive. That's 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 literally all they did. It wasn't. And the the other fun one is Walmart has the same policy. They just don't want to talk about it because Mm. they're getting Mm. the overflow of the million uh, boneheads that don't want to go to Target right now. (laughs) Well, uh, (laughs) as as our friend, the liberal redneck says, that's where all the Duck Dynasty shit is anyway. There you go. Um, but, but it's just, it shows the level at which these people are not looking even a little bit past the surface level. You know, this has been targets policy for years and it hasn't created a problem, but you're saying that targets policy has created the problem and he didn't respond to that. Right. And they're looking, they're looking for a solution to a problem that doesn't exist. Well, yeah. And the, the solution in search of a problem was a thing that Jonah and I had is a phrase that Jonah and I repeated uh, very, very often in that conversation. And it's like, he's getting the same talking points from everyone that he talks to. And Jonah, it's hilarious to me that you said that he's acting like these things are all news to him when he's hearing them. It's like, right. right? <laughs> he's got like a goldfish well, memory. And, and, or something. And, I gotta, and I gotta say the one, the other thing that people are passionate about are gun laws. And if you remove the word trans and replace the word with the word gun in any one of their arguments, it's exactly the same. Yep. If there was a gun in this room, I, my kid might be in danger. Yeah, absolutely. If there was a gun in that room, your kid might be in danger. That's absolutely true. So should we ban guns from Target restrooms? Oh, hell no. We've got the Second Amendment. Well, yeah. Well, And, and, and here's, here's why I think it's different in their mind, okay? Because uh, I've done a lot of thinking about this. Because what I, what I really am interested in doing is, is trying to kind of meet people where they are. Because I... Sometimes you will find people who start out with bigoted attitudes who genuinely just don't know and that they can, you know, their minds can be changed by conversation and by discourse. So what I've tried to do is I've really kind of tried to dive in and figure out where this attitude comes from and where that cognitive dissonance happens. And, and here's what it is. Basically, it's as a white cisgender straight Christian man. I'm the default person. So I am not the problem. And when someone like this tells us that we are supposed to be okay with limiting our access to society for public safety, it doesn't even cross their mind that they might do the same in saying, you know, I'm willing to give up some of the, uh, I'm willing to, to undergo some more restrictions on my rights to own a gun, for example, for public safety. It doesn't enter their mind because in their mind, they're not the problem, right? Because they're the default person, because people who are the default people have the luxury of thinking of themselves as individuals. They don't have to think of themselves based on any of their labels or any of their identities because they have the luxury of thinking of themselves as I'm the default person. So I can, I I can be, uh, you know, judged and, and seen by my individual merits. Whereas trans people are these weird deviant people anyways. So it doesn't really matter that we're limiting their access at all because, right. because they don't matter as much as I do. Is and what I got to say, this is, the, this is the end of days for this particular reason. We are at a point where decisions are being made because of the way that they feel and their, their centric way on themselves. And we're not looking at science or statistics. We have 97% of scientists who believe in global warming, but you know, screw that, I know better. We've exactly. got we've got more people who have been killed by toddlers with guns this year than terrorists. 
<laughs> but <laughs> right. guns are okay. No, that's an actual fact. No, no, okay? you're, yeah, yeah. We've got no issues with trans people in bathrooms, but let's go ahead and put up very big, expensive laws to go ahead and do this. Forget yep. the facts. Yep. Let's just do what we want. Yep. And, and they uh, wonder why we're in trouble. And we uh, we have a caller on the line, area code 859. Who is this? Yes. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Who's this? Callie. It's your lover. Aww. Aww. <laughs> this is my girlfriend, because we're gross. And is, that late? is that late already? Do we have to end the show? <laughs> No. <laughs> what do you got for us, Love? I actually won't be able to see her until tomorrow. What do you got for us, Love? Well, not many people are calling in. I just wanted to join the conversation about this. I don't even have to call him. I didn't even call him a lawmaker because it's ridiculous. He's going and talking to people and acting like he's listening to them and then not even trying to learn. It's crazy. Yeah, and since you called in, obviously you uh, on the last episode you read uh, a poem that you had written about the the bathroom issue. Uh, do you want to you want to talk for a second about that? Yeah, actually, in stark contrast to what you guys have been doing with the uh, lawmaker, I went and spoke with the president of the uh, university I go to, and he actually listened and is now taking action. He's making sure that all new buildings will have um, gender neutral restrooms in it, and he's double checking all policies and seeing if he can get looking to getting the older buildings to have more um, bathroom options for people as well. That's terrific. That's awesome. So, what are some of the problems, though? I mean, because you know, in in your poem, if if folks remember from last week, you know, you talked to kind of alluded to some of the things because there are places in campus that have uh, bathrooms that are gender neutral, right? Mm-hmm. There are just a few. Um, I think throughout the entire campus, there are maybe four or five, but I'm counting ones that are in the dorms that are far off on campus. So. If you know the shopping center near NKU, that's, you know, quite a walking distance. It would take maybe 30 minutes to walk out there. There's a gender neutral bathroom there. You're not going to be able to walk between glasses to go there. So, honestly, I know of three bathrooms that are actually on campus. There's um, the rec center and the gender neutral locker rooms. But those have issues that I don't want to go into tonight. Um, there's the... Um, gender neutral bathroom in Griffin Hall, and there's the gender neutral bathroom in the Honors House. The Honors House is quite a bit of a walk as well, and Griffin Hall is always occupied, and not always for bathroom uses. And so that's where that poem started. Um, One day I was waiting to use the bathroom for 30 minutes, and, you know, I didn't want to leave because I'd already been sitting there. And when the door finally opened and the guy left, I walk in, it just smelled like thick smoke. So someone just been smoking in there the entire time. And that's really frustrating on you. Um, I'm now comfortable using the women's restroom, but back then I I wouldn't even walk into a women's restroom. So I had no other option. It was... Yeah, and, and that's something that happens a lot like with, with, uh, with trans folks who – you know, we're in places who are less inclusive. You know, I have people who, you know, at work are like, there's one bathroom that you can use in the entire building and it's, you know, five floors up on the other side. So good luck with that kind of thing. Um, Jonah, mm-hmm. you had, you had an experience like that, right? At school. Yeah. When I was in nursing school, um, I wasn't walking up to my professors and telling them, hi, I'm Jonah, I'm trans, but I was the president of the, the GSA of the school. And, you know, it was known and they decided to go to the hospital where I had clinicals and ask the hospital, what should, what should they do with this trans student? And the hospital said, well, don't let the, the student be alone in the room with the patient and they have to use the unisex uh, family bathroom two floors up and across the campus of the hospital. I could not use the unisex staff bathroom. That was single stall. Ugh. All right. Well, Celeste, love, thank you for calling in. I love yep. you a lot. Thanks for taking the call. <laughs> I, I love, love you. you. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Yep. Bye. Bye. Uh, I'm going to be gross and talk about how, how much I love my girlfriend for just a quick second because I love her a lot. I don't um, 
<laughs> so, all right. So we've got, and we've got a, about 10 minutes left and I'm not going to cut the conversation off at a specific time just for the sake of doing so. But what I would like to hear, um, from, from anyone who, who wants to, to opine or talk about their experiences, what are we hearing from folks in the community? Um, I know Jonah and I have have contact with some of the more marginalized folks in our community. Um, Greta, I'm not sure you know what your uh, involvement is with that. Um, so what are we what are we hearing from folks? what are, What are people afraid of? What are they saying? What are they planning to do? That kind of stuff. Anybody who wants to jump in. I hear worry. I hear people experiencing, we talked about this a bit earlier, but people experiencing an increase in even just the snide comments, the, the things that are just wearing people down every day by those around them. Um, not to mention, you know, some increasing violence, but in general, in the area, it, it, it hasn't been that bad. The way my wife puts this entire um, movement right now, this anti-trans movement, is uh, that this the hate is loud but the ability to do anything really meaningful is not really there this is the last gasp of their movement and it's going to be over soon i completely agree i'm seeing so i'm on the other side of this i'm seeing it from corporate america and there is a support for trans people there is a vocal support of trans people um except for your chick Filet and your few other small companies that just don't count for a lot of different reasons. Um, they they are out there. They want to, the stories to be told. They are willing to put out the press releases saying that we are inclusive. And um, you know, they're if you're not this way, um, you're gonna. You, uh, they're looking at the long term. And you know, we have in uh, 2025, we will have 75 percent of the workforce um, is going to be millennials. And millennials are very accepting of the LGBT community. They believe in gay marriage. They believe in trans rights and safety. Um, those are companies that continue to hold on to these values of hate and division um, or won't even just stand up for what's right um, are going to be on the uh, losing side. And Absolutely, Jen. And uh, that's sort of the counterpoint to these negative things that I've heard is I'm hearing a lot more people say, hey, you know, my employer is going to cover my surgery or my boss stood up for me when this person said something. So that sort of stuff is much more quiet in general than this hate. But the, the tide has turned. I, I think that um, it's not a matter of, of whether we're going to win overall acceptance. I think that is – a foregone conclusion. I think it's really a matter of how many people are we going to lose on the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah. So I really, I think that this is a good time. At, this is a time when everybody's probably feeling um, a little bit less healthy than they have. And I think it's a good time for everybody to just make a conscious effort to support the other trans folks, you know, in your area, just to make sure that Every you know that you're being kinder to people, that you're going out of your way to help people. You know, th nobody's coming to save us. <laughs> We're going to save ourselves. We're going to need to save ourselves. And um, I just want to really encourage everybody, every person that it's out there listening, every trans person, you can be there for the people that you love, and and you can really you know small things go a long way. And so really, like let's as a community, let's try to be. Um, more careful about what we say to who and how we say it and to check in on the people who are, who we know have a harder time. So yeah, it's important. I, I completely agree. And that was actually going to be kind of my next thing. So, um, so way to, way to go on that. Um, I was, <laughs> what I was going to say is I, I know there are folks who listen to the show who, who are in, you know, some pretty rough positions, people who, uh, people who can't be out, you know, people who are in bad situations at school, at work, uh, in their personal life and stuff like that. And that was going to be my next question. You know, if, if, uh, you know, if we know those people are, are listening, I was just going to kind of go through the panel and say, you know, what, what would you say to those folks? So we've heard, heard from Greta, Jonah, what would you say to, to somebody who's, who's in that position, who's listening? You cut out for a bit there. So come back to me once I hear you. Oh, you're good. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, what I was going to say, basically, there, there are lots of folks who listen to the show that I know that are in pretty rough spots. 
um, you know, folks who are having trouble at school, at work, uh, in their personal lives and that kind of stuff, who are, who are really, really feeling the weight of all of this. So if you had the ear of those folks to tell them something, what would it be? Self-care is really important. You know, take time away from all of those stressful things. Do what you can to build yourself back up because we need armor to move about the world, right? It's hard. Reach out. Reach out to people that you know can be a good shoulder for you. I hear that. Ari, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, reach out definitely. Um, There is a whole community thanks to the internet and you know local groups if you're able to get to one of people who care about you who have you know been through similar things um who even even if they haven't been through the exact same thing they can empathize with you because they've been through something similar so you know we're here for you please as you say in the outro please don't be afraid to reach out um we we will do anything that we can to to try and help you through this and finally jen what do you got Oh, boy. It's hard to follow after those. Those are wonderful. (laughs) Um, All I can say is in the old days when I was little, if you were gay, you went to San Francisco, or if you knew about it, you went to New York. Um, We live in a wonderful time here where you can find people on the Internet, where there are many more places where you can find community. I happen to be a member of the Cincinnati community, and this is a loving community. This is a city you can live in if you're trans, and I know that's very surprising to people, but you can. And it does get better if you get out there and you live your life, and the more of us who are out there living our lives, the more visible we will be, and the more this hate just will die under its own weight. I hear that. Um, you know, the already mentioned the outro of the show, and, you know, it's... Uh, Sometimes it can kind of sound like a script because I say it at the end of every show. Because it's literally um, a script. And <laughs> because it's literally a script, I read it. I read it from the run sheet to make sure that I don't miss any words. <laughs> but legitimately, I mean these things. Um, you know, I I am relatively privileged for a trans person, as I say often, because it's something that's important to point out. But I mean, I was absolutely terrified to come out and realizing that there was community is what helped me do what I did in coming out. Um, it was my first pride festival really that let me know that there are groups of people who are living their lives as the people that they've always known themselves to be. And that this is a thing that's possible and that people can do this and people can be happy and live lives that are worth living. So, Obviously, community is vital. Community is vital for human beings, period, because we're social creatures. But for people who are as vulnerable as many of us are in whatever ways that we're vulnerable, it's vital. And what I'm glad to say is that there are more and more of these communities cropping up. There's more and more support groups, more and more support organizations, more and more supportive companies, uh, more and more places on the Internet where people can go because there are still folks who are in, uh, you know, who may be rural or who may live in small towns where there these things still don't exist. There are still people who suffer from a lack of those resources to go to. But what I can't emphasize enough is to, is to just reach out because the, I, I guarantee you that there are people who care about you and people who love you and that you, you don't have to feel alone because you're not, um, you know, I care. I, I spend a significant amount of my time, you know, responding to emails and talking to people who reach out to me on Facebook and that kind of stuff. And, um, and I do these things not because it's activist stuff or anything like that. I do this be the reason that I started the show that I do activism, that I do any of the stuff that I do is because I love people. I don't make money doing this. <laughs> um, the, the Patreon money goes straight back into the podcast. It goes into travel and equipment and that kind of stuff. I don't make money doing this and I don't care if I ever do what it's about for me is letting hurting people know that they don't have to hurt, uh, that, you know, how you feel about the situation that you're in is okay. You're allowed to feel however you want to feel, but at the very least you don't have to do it alone. So that's why we do what we do. And I just want to emphasize that to anyone who's listening, you know, the atheist manifesto at gmail.com is our email address. Uh, I'm just Callie Wright on Facebook. Um, I'll friend request or message pretty much anyone. (laughs) So, 
Um, before we go here, Greta, real quick, can you repeat the phone number for Trans Lifeline so uh, we get that on record so folks know where to go? Uh, sure thing. So, um, oh my gosh, I don't want to get it wrong. I'm going to the site. To make sure. <laughs> You're it's one eight seven seven five six five eight eight six zero 8860 is the U.S. and eight seven seven three three zero six three six six in Canada. And uh, Jonah, one more time, can you tell us where we can find uh, Heartland Trans Wellness? Yeah, you can go to transwellness.org. That's T-R-A-N-S-W-E-L-L-N-E-S-S dot org. Or you can call 513-620-4539. Or you can email info at transwellness.org. Or look for us on Facebook, Heartland Trans Wellness. And Jen, did you have anything that you wanted to plug? The only thing I wanted to plug was my friend Kelly. She has a wonderful show. You should all listen to it. <laughs> I'm very proud of her. I, I, I do have to say, I'm going to out you just a little, really quickly here. I was no outing. her before she, before she transitioned. We were in support groups together. Yes. And I remember texting her in the morning to make sure she got up out of bed. So I am incredibly proud of this woman and what she has accomplished. Oh, oh. it's so <laughs> precious. I thought I was going to get through this episode without crying, Jen. <laughs> You're welcome. Very, very <laughs> no, but seriously, um, you know, I, I would talk sometimes in support groups about how bad things were getting for me at work and how you know tough it was to live this double life where I was out in the rest of my life and I had to pretend, you know, I had to go back into the closet at work. And, uh, and that was, you know, th- that was kind of all of the darkest points of my life kind of had to do with that. Um, and Jen really did, you know, do a lot to just kind of remind me like, Hey, you know, just tap you on the shoulder. Like, Hey, you're going to be okay. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. Cause I, I'm not sure that I ever told you exactly how much that meant to me. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. My, my pleasure. And I'm so proud. Oh, I love you. <laughs> Don't make me cry. It's <laughs> a big old crying fist. <laughs> we do that enough on this show. That's true. Well, that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Atheist Manifesto on Secular Media Network. I want to say thank you to my co-host, Ari. Thanks, Ari. Oh, you're welcome, Callie. <laughs> this is so nice. And I want to thank Jen, Greta, and Jonah for being on the show, being so generous with their time and their stories. You can find the show on Facebook at facebook.com slash Manifesto. You can email us at thegatheistmanifesto at gmail.com. I'm on Twitter at GatheistCali, and I'm sure Ari's going to do a thing. Well, shoot, y'all. I guess it's time for me to scoot. If y'all ever want to find me, I'm in the trailer park on the west side of the interstate, about two miles down the road from old Jimmy's Speed Store off Exit 9. Just make a left at the stoplight near the Johnson's house and keep on going for about a stone's throw. And I'm in the fourth trailer from the right. You can't miss it. Just come on in. The screen door is always open. You know, my son Billy set me up one of them email deals on my new computer. So if you can't get yourself here on account of the roving packs of coyotes or one of them thar tornadoes, I do suppose you could sit yourself down in front of that screen and write me out a nice letter, just like we used to do in the old days for all this fancy texted chats and time faces and Lord knows what else. Billy told me the address is Ari Stillman 4 at Netscape.com. Wait, was that Billy? It's not Netscape? Dang, these technologies keep on changing so quick I can't hardly keep up. Billy says it's on the Gmails, so I guess you gotta sign up for one of those. I ain't too sure, I tell you what. Oh, I guess I had to get one of those MySpaces, too, that all kids are into these days. Billy said he sent me up some kind of a fence or a wall or something on the MyFace page, so I guess I'm Ari Stillman on there, too. You know, back when I was a youngin', we all played outside in the dirt. But then Barack Hussein Obama took away all our guns. So now how are the kids supposed to pass the time? Oh, hell, them dogs are fighting again. Well, y'all come back now, you hear? I like you less and less every time you <laughs> do one of those. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> that is not what you say. You should say you love uh, me more and more. Yeah, that something. You can, you can find the. Lucky or you're just jealous. <laughs> and you can find the show on Twitter at the Gatheists. If you want to support the work that we do, you can head to Patreon.com/slash The Gatheist Manifesto and make a per episode donation to support the production of the show and the activism we do. If that's not doable, totally okay. I understand times are rough. You can still go to iTunes and leave us a five star rating to get us heard by more people. Before we go, I want you to know that if you're lost, you're hurting. You're scared. If you feel like no one cares and no one understands, 
You need to know there's a community out here that loves you, cares for you, knows that you're capable of amazing things and that you are worthy of love. If you're struggling, please don't be afraid to reach out. Until next time, friends, this is the Gaytheist Manifesto. Manifesto.